Hey, welcome to another episode of Mike's Collection. I'm Mike, and today we're going to be talking about my collection. Um, now, in the last bunch of videos, I've been doing reviews, uh, full waves of G.I. Joe. In my last review video, I did uh, all the Pacific Rim kaiju figures from NECA. So if you're interested in those, go check those out. But I really don't want my channel to just be uh, toy reviews. I'm hoping that it can be a bit more of a... Uh, show where we have conversations about toys, about movies, uh, about whatever other nerdy stuff. Uh, here's Casey, by the way. I try and film these without her, but she just whines and whines outside the door when she's not included. So, so yeah, here she is. So this is going to be a bit of an experimental episode. I don't really have a an agenda, any sort of plan. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about what's been going on this week and see if this works because I would like to do more episodes like this where it's not just me fidgeting around with figures uh, in front of the camera. So um, I will start the episode off though with waving little toys in front of the, the camera. So I thought when I do an episode like this it might be nice to share with you um, what new figures I've gotten this week. Now if you follow Mike's Collection Halifax on Instagram you should have already seen the figures I've gotten this week because I try and post uh, pictures of each one as I get them. But this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit more about each one. So, uh, yeah. I didn't pick up much this week. Um, I had said in my prior videos I'm waiting for a couple of things in the mail. And uh, nothing has showed up yet. That's the problem with living in Canada. I get ship notifications. Um, I ordered something from Big Bad Toy Store, which is a, a website that I buy a lot of my stuff from. Uh, it's a great site, but uh, it takes a while. I got a ship notification on January 25th, and today is March 1st, and uh, I'm not able to track it myself with the tracking number they give me. I called them uh, like two days ago to see if they could give me any information, and Big Bad Toy Store told me that they could see the tracking and that the item was in Chicago. So, God knows. I might still have another couple of weeks before it shows up here. Um, I also have shipment coming from Super 7 and they have kind of a weird I got an email notification about a week ago that said my item has shipped and they sent me a tracking number for it now uh, I didn't check the tracking for about a week no. uh, but when I finally uh, did it was just showing that label had been created and it hadn't left yet and then a couple of days after that I got an email so a full week from the initial email that said my item had shipped I got an email that said from Super 7 that said, your item is on the way. So the first email was really just telling me that the shipping label was created, not that it had left. So yeah, that just left like the day before yesterday. So I've probably got a month wait before that shows up. And I'm still waiting for my last uh, shipment from the G.I. Joe Collectors Club for my final installment of Figure Subscription Service 8. So yeah, I've got a lot of different things coming. Um, I'm also on the lookout for the latest wave of Marvel Legends, which I'm hoping will hit stores anytime now. And that's the uh, the Kingpin Build-A-Figure wave. So yeah, that's all the stuff I'm looking for. Nothing's come yet. So I have just two items to tell you about today that I picked up this week. So yeah, let me put Casey down and we'll take a closer look at my purchases. So the first figure I picked up this week is Mystique from the X-Men. So you might know her from the movies. She was played by Rebecca Romaine in the original movies and then uh, Jennifer Lawrence in the more recent movies. So she is a villainous character from the X-Men who has the ability to transform into uh, anyone. So this is a pretty nice figure. I like that face sculpt a lot. A lot of personality in there. It looks very realistic. And yeah, overall... A nice figure, nice figure, relatively uh, simple. She has a few accessories with her. You'll see I've got a little gold pistol in her hand. She also has this uh, gold rifle. And we've seen these weapons before. I think they came with the Punisher and maybe Paladin. And she's got a couple alternate heads. So this head here is a rogue head. And they've got the, so it's the same head that we got on the rogue figure, but you see it's painted half like Mystique. So this is supposed to show her mid-transformation. So that's kind of neat. 
Although that will definitely go in the spare parts bin. I don't intend to display that uh, anytime soon. And then we also have this head here. So this is for, I think it's Lilandra. Is that how you say that? Uh, and she is a next one character from the uh, Shire Empire. And yeah, I guess it's a good way to get a Lilandra head because we probably won't get a figure of her ever. But I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with that. It would definitely look kind of weird on Mystique's body. Um, I've seen some people put it on Silver Sable's body if you really wanted a Lilandra figure. But uh, yeah, those will probably all go in the spare parts bin. So yeah, here's Mystique. I'm pretty happy with her. And yeah, she didn't come with any Build-A-Figure parts or anything because she's not part of any particular wave. She's one of these uh, store exclusives. I believe she's exclusive to maybe Walgreens. That seems to be the store that gets most of the exclusives like the Fantastic Four uh, and the Silver Surfer. Um, but yeah, here in Canada, we get her at EB Games. And this is the other toy I bought. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you that I paid money for this thing because this thing is small. So I'll bring him right up close so you can see him. So he is kind of neat looking, but this is the kind of thing I would expect to get out of a gumball machine. But uh, yeah, he was at Toys R Us and I think the regular price said he was 12 bucks, but he was marked down half price. So he was like $6.99. And I went to Toys R Us. I, did, I don't get there all that often. Uh, there's one not too far from my house, but uh, I still sometimes it's, it's weeks or a month before I'm over at that store. So I was over there the other day and uh, I thought, okay, well, I'll go in and find something. And there's just nothing in there that really was speaking to me. So I hate leaving empty handed. And I saw this thing and I was like, well, what the heck? It's half price. I'll pick it up. So what this is, this is a Transformer character named Bludgeon. And Bludgeon in the original toy line was a pretender. So he was a little transforming robot. And he came with a big plastic shell that didn't really move. And you just put the little robot inside. And he was encased in this kind of big chubby shell. And some of them were monsters. Some of them were people. And he happened to be in a samurai with a skeleton face. And uh, inside, the little robot was nothing uh, nothing unique about the little robot itself. He transformed into a tank. And I never had that toy when I was a kid. Uh, Pretenders kind of came after my time. I kind of stopped buying Transformers at the, that time. But Bludgeon has been prominently featured in the comic books and stuff since. So I've become a real fan of this character. And now when he's portrayed in the comic books... They tend not to really talk about the fact that he's a pretender. They tend to just show him basically like this. Like this is his main form. And so I've wanted a good bludgeon toy for a while. And they haven't been putting any out. So this is the bludgeon toy I bought a while back. And I was pretty happy with him. There we go. This is better. So this one here is kind of cartoony looking. And that's because he's based on like an animated line from, uh, he's only about two years old or so. I forget what the line was actually called. But, uh, so he doesn't really look like a G1 Transformer, but if the price is right, this thing was only about 15 bucks or so, and I thought he looked pretty cool. And you can clearly tell it's Bludgeon, he's got his samurai helmet and his skull face, and yeah, so that's the Bludgeon in my Transformers collection. And here's another cool version of Bludgeon we got a couple of years ago. This is a G.I. Joe version of Bludgeon, and he was included in a, I think it was a San Diego convention set. So this is the first time we saw this samurai look. They later used it to create uh, Budo, who is the G.I. Joe like, samurai character. But at the time, this was pretty new and unique. Uh, he's got the samurai helmet that comes off, and you've got this like robotic skull face underneath. Yeah, so as a fan of Bludgeon, I just thought that was really neat. And the fact that he's a G.I. Joe, he's in like G.I. Joe form, I thought was kind of a nod to him being a pretender. Like, is, is this his form or inside of this, is there a little robot? I don't know. But anyway, so with this version, this version of Bludgeon is probably the one that looks closest to the vintage figure. And the reason I picked it up is because he is a pretender. You open that shell up and there is a little robot inside. So yeah, this is Bludgeon's true form, and it is a pretty ghetto little, little toy. Um, I don't 
time to display him like this, obviously, because he doesn't look like anything. He almost looks like a, a spare part you could throw in the garbage if you weren't paying attention. So yeah, I will keep him displayed in his Pretender shell. And yeah, I would have rather this was only a dollar, but what the heck, seven bucks, he was cute. I like the character, so yeah, there you go. So yeah, those are the new items that I got this week. Um, now let's talk about uh, news, if there's anything else that came out. Um, we just had Toy Fair uh, two weeks ago, so a lot of big toy news came out then. So it might be a little quiet for the next little while as far as uh, toy reveals go. Um, but this week, uh, just the other day, there was a reveal from Hasbro that they've got a Star Wars Black Series 4-pack coming out. Uh, they've put out a couple of these before, uh, and they're usually pretty cool. They kind of contain like army builders. They did one of just stormtroopers, which, uh, which I got. And it had the cool uh, red Inferno Trooper. And they've done one with Royal Guards. So that's the standard red Royal Guard that we all know from Return of the Jedi. Along with the blue Royal Guard from the prequels. And then the uh, Praetorian Guard or whatever from the new movies. And then a black Royal Guard as well. Didn't get that set either. Um, and then they've done one with the Clone Troopers. So if you're familiar with those sets, they've got another one of those coming out. And... It is apparently exclusive to the Disney theme parks. But uh, yeah, I'll probably try and track this one down through other means. It's got some cool figures. Uh, it's got a, a Kylo Ren, which looks like it might have some some new parts to Kylo. Because I don't necessarily need him. But he's also got some troop builders. So there's a new Stormtrooper type, which is called a Mountain Trooper. And I'm a sucker for Stormtroopers. My Black Series, I don't buy all the figures they put out, but I tend to buy every version of Stormtrooper they put out. So I've got a pretty good crew of those guys over there. And the other one is another Stormtrooper variation, but it's a unique character like Captain Phasma. So this is a Stormtrooper-like character uh, who's got gold armor. And the uh, name is Commander Pyre. And I guess they're from the new uh, Resistance cartoon, which I'm not familiar with yet, but looks cool anyway. And then the fourth figure in that set is a mouse droid, which is just those little things that wheel around the Death Star. So, kind of sucks. You'd kind of hope you'd get four figures in a four-pack, because one of them is just... Mm. But uh, similarly, when I got the, the Stormtrooper pack, there was only three Stormtroopers and uh, an R2 unit in there. So not quite four full-size figures, but still pretty cool. Hopefully the price reflects the fact that the fourth figure is just a, a little teeny mouse droid. Uh... Also in news this week, nothing else for toys, but there's been some, some movie news, or at least some reveals. Um, we got a couple of new trailers dropped. First, we got the X-Men Dark Phoenix trailer, and that didn't do anything for me. I don't know if it's the fault of the trailer, but uh, I'm just kind of over the Fox X-Men movies. Uh, the continuity is too screwed up. Um, the fact that they recast and just these actors I'm not that interested in. Like, this one focuses on Jean Grey. And I can't even tell you the name of the actress that plays the young Jean Grey in these last couple of movies. And, you know, the young Cyclops. Uh, the young Storm. So we saw a lot of these characters in X-Men Apocalypse and stuff, which I thought was completely boring. Uh, yeah, so I'm just kind of over these things, which is weird. I never thought I'd get to the point where I'm just... Might not even go see an X-Men movie. Because uh, I'm at that point with the Transformers movies. I really like Bumblebee. But I didn't see the last two Transformers movies in theaters. And if I was... When I was a kid and you told me that someday they're going to be making Transformers live action movies and X-Men live action movies. And you'll actually get so bored of them that you'll stop going to see them. I, I wouldn't have believed you. But that's what's happening. I don't know if I'll see this movie. The trailer looks a lot of... Looks like a lot of things we've seen from uh, X-Men 3. And I know everybody hates X-Men 3 and wants to forget about it. I didn't mind X-Men 3. But those scenes with Jean possessed by the Dark Phoenix and wiping out everybody and all kinds of devastation. That looks the same as what I'm seeing in this one here. So, not that excited. Um, the other trailer we saw was for Hellboy. Now, I am pretty excited about the Hellboy movie. Although that excitement was tempered by the last trailer. Like the teaser, I guess it was, or trailer number one, because uh, 
I've, I love the Hellboy comics. I've been on board with Hellboy pretty much since the beginning, but I have read everything that they've put out there. Big fan of the comic books. And then Guillermo del Toro came out and did those movies, which I liked a lot as well, but they're far from perfect. You know, they don't quite capture the feeling of the, uh, the comic books. But uh, a noble effort, and I enjoy them. So when they announced they were going to reboot the franchise, but take a darker tone, and I think they said be more faithful to the comic books, I was excited to see that. But then the first trailer came out, and it had Moni Moni as the music, and there was a lot of jokes and one-liners, and it just looked kind of corny. So I was like, I don't know what this... Now the second trailer looks better. It makes it look more promising for sure. It's still got kind of a weird choice with uh, like smoke on the water as the music for the trailer. And, uh, but we see a lot more characters that are going to appear, such as the uh, like Baba Yaga, which is a, a character that's pretty prominent in the comic books, as well as his uh, partner. It doesn't look like we're going to get Abe Sapien in this one, but we've got Ben uh, Damio. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Now, he was a character in the comic books who was uh, kind of a military guy. And he'd been in the comic books for quite a while before it was revealed that he was a were-jaguar. Like werewolf, but he turns into a big jaguar creature. And so I, I knew that character was going to be in the movie. Um, I didn't know if they'd go there with him, but they are. The trailer shows his transformation. Um, and yeah, there's lots of cool imagery in there, but there is still some cheesy lines and weird music and I'm still on the fence this could could be awesome could be garbage or could be somewhere in in the middle which is probably most likely what's gonna happen so yeah that's it for news that I have so um next maybe I'll talk about um well we'll continue on with movies I guess but I'll talk about some movies that I've seen recently and when I was at work yesterday, I was messing around with some title cards. So they're, they're kind of corny too. But uh, I hope if I do episodes like this on the regular, I will have segments that may not be in every single episode. Because maybe I didn't see any movies that week. But uh, yeah, if I see them, I hope to use these title cards. So you might see these come back. Or if I decide after posting this video that they're too cheesy, you might never see them again. But okay, so let's head to our first segment. Flick Chat. Yeah, so welcome to Flick Chat, where we talk about movies. Now, I actually haven't been to the theater to see anything uh, in a little while now. I, I was kind of meaning to go see Alita Battle Angel, especially because uh, my fiance Vanessa was away uh, last week. So I thought that would be a good time to go see that movie, either with one of my buddies or even by myself. But I just didn't get around to it. My buddies have all been tied up. And I honestly feel bad leaving the Casey here, who keeps trying to jump off her little chair. That's why I seem distracted. Um, but I feel bad leaving them alone to go to a movie for two and a half hours. So yeah, I just didn't make it to Alita. Um, but maybe I'll have a review of that sometime. But I'm, honestly, at this point, it's been out a couple of weeks. I probably won't see it. Um, same as with Fighting With My Family. I might go see that because Vanessa is home now and she's interested in seeing that, surprisingly. Um, neither of us are wrestling fans. But we are fans of Steve Merchant, who, uh, who wrote and directed this. And the reviews are really positive, too. So that helps um, to convince her to go. So, yeah, we might see that. So what I did watch, though, um, the other day I watched Polar on Netflix. It's a uh, movie on there that's a Netflix exclusive. And it was recommended to me by my buddy Miguel. I wasn't familiar with it, but it is actually based on a comic book, I guess, an online comic book. Yeah, what's up? Come here. Come here. Come here. Alright. And yeah, so it starred uh, Mad Mickelson. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But the dude that plays Hannibal in the TV series. And played uh, Galen Erso in Star Wars Rogue One. Anyway, he's a, he's a cool actor. I like him in all of his kind of smaller roles. I didn't really watch Hannibal, but from Rogue One and from... Uh, what was it? The, uh, the first Daniel Craig there, uh, Bond movie. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed this guy. And he was really cool in this movie. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but I recommend checking it out as long as you don't mind a lot of sex and a lot of violence. It is really over-the-top, kind of Sin City-esque in 
gore level. People are getting, you know, blown apart left, right, and center. It's really bloody, and uh, yeah, it's pretty sexed up too. It's like it was written by a, you know, 13-year-old boy, and uh, so that could be kind of corny, but it was kind of fun too. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, messing around with it. It was a lot of action, a lot of, a lot of funny scenes as well. And yeah, so I liked it a lot. So check that out on Netflix. Also on Netflix, uh, I watched The Umbrella Academy. So I, I went through all 10 episodes of that in about a week. Uh, I enjoyed it a ton. Now, I'm a fan of the comic book. And that stems from I'm a big fan of Gerard Way, who wrote it. Uh, I've been a My Chemical Romance fan from the get-go. Um, so when I found out he was going to be writing comic books, I was, I was right there to check out what he was going to do. And yeah, he came out of the gate with uh, his best work. The Umbrella Academy was great. Um, I bought and I bought everything he's put out since, and I don't think anything has been quite as good. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the Umbrella Academy, the first series as well as the the second mini series. There's a third one that's out now. Um, I haven't read that yet because I'm waiting for the uh, the trade paperback collection. But yeah, the series is based. The TV series is based on the first collection or the first six issues I guess it was and uh, yeah now honestly it's been quite a few years since I've read the Umbrella Academy so I wasn't necessarily noticing everything they changed I wasn't thinking like hey he didn't look like that or this did, scene didn't happen I was just enjoying it for what it was and I definitely was thinking I don't recall this happening in the comic book there was a little bit of that but I couldn't think of specifics which is which is fine because sometimes when you're too you know a property too well, you can't help but be bothered by the changes they make. But yeah, this one here, I know they made changes, but I wasn't really noticing them. And I just thought the series was a ton of fun. Uh, when I first saw pictures of the cast, I was a little skeptical. Like, most of them are unknown, other than Ellen Page, who's from my hometown of Halifax here. Um, so, other than Ellen Page, I wasn't really familiar with any of these guys. At least I didn't think I was. Um... But yeah, when I saw them, I'm like, he doesn't look like him. He doesn't look like he's supposed to. Like, for example, Space Boy, who is the character with the big gorilla body. Uh, in the comic books, he's got this little head and this huge, gigantic gorilla body. And uh, when I saw the trailers, I'm like, oh, they just, they didn't even go with the gorilla body. He's just a guy in a trench coat. I'm like, I understand that probably would have been expensive to pull off CGI-wise, but I'm like, it's kind of lame that it's not there. And the character that played Seance the guy that talks to the dead. He was, uh, in the comic books, kind of like, like blonde hair, kind of swept over to the side, very emo style. And when I saw the guy that got to play him, he had crazy curly brown hair, a little goatee, and it just, you know, it didn't look right. I was like, yeah, I don't know about this casting. But uh, I loved the cast. I thought they were all great. Um, I thought they made, made all the characters more memorable than they were in the comic books. I would actually like to see when the comic book continues if the characters take on more of the aspects of these characters the way they were portrayed in the show. And it made me go back and look up who these guys were. I'm like, these guys can't have just been nobodies. They're, they're awesome in this role. And so the guy who played Space Boy, the only thing I know him from was the uh, Amy Schumer movie, I Feel Pretty. He had a role in that as kind of a, you know, good-looking owner of a makeup company or whatever and uh yeah so i never would have pegged him to play space boy in this kind of dark twisted comic book universe after seeing him in that role but yeah i thought he was great and also the the kid that plays seance um he was in the british superhero -y show uh, misfits which i had watched several years ago and so i didn't recognize him because he's obviously quite a few years older but I'm, i really liked that show and i really liked all the actors in that so when I looked up the IMDb and saw who he was, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because, yeah, he's, he was great, too. So, yeah, just great casting all around. Super enjoyed the show. Loved the way it wrapped up. Um, the kid who played number five, uh, he was brilliant, too. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was just all good. So even though they made some changes, and they, I don't like when they change things, for example... They don't use any of those names, the Space Boy and Seance. Uh, they're kind of just dropped a couple of them almost as a joke. 
but those aren't the characters' names, but they were very clearly the names in the comic book. And you're like, why don't they use these names? Why don't they, you know, why did they change that? But uh, other than a couple of those couple little nitpicks or whatever, yeah, it was just uh, a lot of fun. So I highly recommend The Umbrella Academy. And uh, oddly enough, Gerard Way uh, is also writing the current incarnation of Doom Patrol. And that series, uh, that comic book series, has also been adapted into a TV show, which premiered, I guess, the exact same day as Umbrella Academy. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, the platform. I'm not even sure which one it's on. But uh, yeah, after seeing how well Umbrella Academy worked out, I'm pretty curious to check out uh, Doom Patrol. So maybe seek that one out too, and you guys can let me know if it's worth my time. So yeah, I think that's it for movies. Uh, as for stuff I've purchased, I'm still one of those guys that buys movies. I like to buy movies. I've gotten to the point now where when they first come out, I usually think, okay, I don't need to buy this right away. I can probably wait, you know, two months and it'll go down 10 bucks. But I like having physical movies. So um, the two I bought this week is I just bought uh, The Predator, which was the latest uh, Predator movie uh, directed by Shane Black. Which, you know, I saw in the theaters and I haven't watched it since. I haven't got around to watching the Blu-ray yet because I literally just picked it up uh, yesterday or the day before. But I'm curious to watch some of the bonus features and stuff on there. I thought this was a good Predator movie in the same way that I think all the Predator movies have been great for the last... Or, sorry, have been good the last few years. They have not been great. I loved the first Predator movie when I was a kid. Uh, one of my favorites. I thought all the human characters, even though some of them only had limited screen time, uh, they were all memorable characters, and the alien stayed mysterious, and he was really cool. As the years have gone on, and they've made more and more of these, especially the aliens versus Predator, I find the uh, the alien less mysterious, and he gets a little less cool every time we learn a little bit more about him. And the human characters, just none of them have lived up to Arnie and his crew in the first movie. I didn't like Predator 2 when I was a kid when that first came out, but I've kind of really grown to like that one over the years. And even though I was super disappointed with Alien versus Predator one and two, I've kind of found ways in hindsight to say, you know what, okay, well this isn't too bad, it was kind of interesting, it did something, and so this one's better than those. Um, yeah, it was cool, introduced some new, cool new concepts, um, but yeah, I really had high hopes for this when it was first announced, because it sounded like they wanted to get just back to basics, and they got some, uh, some talent on it, and uh, yeah, it, it was good, I enjoyed the human cast in this. But yeah, they're, they're, they're not the crew from, from the first movie. And the other one I picked up, which don't make fun, but I picked up Bridget Jones's Baby. And so yeah, this is the third one in the trilogy, I guess. And it was it was in a five buck bin, so I didn't pay too much for that. Yeah, and as for the Predator, that had dropped down to 17 bucks at Walmart rather than the 25 it was when it first came out a month or so ago. So uh, yeah, I don't know, Bridget Jones is a guilty, guilty pleasure of mine. I like those British style comedies, you know, about a boy, love actually. Um, I like those a lot. And Bridget Jones is in the same vein, same style of humor. And yeah, I liked the first two a bunch. And then I was a little worried when the third one was announced because I know uh, Renee Zellweger, you know, she hadn't been doing much. I'd seen pictures of her in the tabloids. She looked drastically different. And I'm like, I don't know if they should revisit this. And sure enough, that one's not as good as the, uh, the first two, but it was still cute. You know, uh, I missed Hugh Grant in there, but uh, Patrick Dempsey, he was decent as a replacement. So yeah, check out Bridget Jones' Baby. Um, so that's it for that segment. Um, so I designed a second title card. So let's move into that. Comic book in. So in this segment, I figure I will maybe talk about the comic books that I've purchased uh, in the past I say week, but I don't know if I'll post these types of episodes weekly. But maybe if I do these every two weeks or every month even, I'll talk about the comic books that I bought uh, and just what's going on. I'll try and keep them spoiler free, but just kind of thumbs up, thumbs down type thing. Now, however, I just posted a video a couple of days ago about the stack of comic books that I've been reading in the past month. So I really don't have anything new uh, to talk about. I just really wanted to use the title card. So I thought, okay, well, let's talk about comic books. We'll talk something. So... I thought I'd use this segment to talk a little bit about a couple of G.I. Joe crossovers. Uh, I just went over to my, my comic book shelf and I was like, what can I talk about kind of quickly? 
And these kind of stood out. These are both just one-offs. And they're from the last, just from the last uh, two years, maybe? I can't remember exactly when they were published, but they're not very old. You could probably still find them around. So the first one is G.I. Joe versus Street Fighter. And this book was a ton of fun. The art... Let me see there. Cartoony, exaggerated, um, but just, yeah. The storyline in this was super, I don't want to say weak, but non-existent, I guess. Like when you, the first page here, you'll see they're about to do battle in the Street Fighter tournament. There's no elaborate setup about how do these two characters come together? Like, how do they meet? How did G.I. Joe discover the Street Fighter tournament? Or, it just starts. It's like G.I. Joe's in this tournament, and every issue focused on, I think, it was one or two battles. And so each issue was just fights. There was a little bit of dialogue here and there to set up a bit of a storyline, but uh, not much of one. But for things like this, or it was just a one-off. It wasn't going to continue into a whole series. I'm glad they didn't waste a lot of time with setup. So yeah, I just thought this was a ton of fun and a beautiful looking book. Now, it was written by Aubrey Sitterson, who was writing the G.I. Joe book, the regular book, for a while. And he is kind of a divisive uh, character in the G.I. Joe world. Um, because I don't have all the facts on this, but he did after he'd been on the book for a little while, and people were already not necessarily loving what he was doing, I really did enjoy it. I wasn't a big fan of the art that was paired with his writing on this G.I. Joe series he was on. But uh, he really delved into the goofy aspects of G.I. Joe. So Cobra La and monsters and sci-fi goofiness. And I was really digging it. It was a lot of fun and different from some of the darker tones that IDW had taken with the G.I. Joe book before that. Uh, but then Aubrey made some tweets about 9-11 that pissed people off. And then people were boycotting the book and... Uh, it got cancelled promptly afterwards, and I think IDW said the two weren't related. It just wasn't doing well sales-wise, which I would believe that too, but at the same time, it seemed a little convenient in the timing. So, I get why people were pissed off, and I get why IDW decided to get rid of the guy, but uh, I really liked what he was doing, uh, especially the, the book ended very abruptly, uh, and... They just introduced, like, the army ants, if you're familiar with them, an 80s, 80s toy line, into the book. And uh, so, yeah, you had some Transformers, some army ants, some G.I. Joe. It was just like he dumped his toy box on the floor, and it was just, it was fun. So I'm sorry to see that end. But this book here is separate from all that stuff. And again, though, it just feels like he's mashing his toys together, and it was a, it was a joy to read. So, yeah, check out G.I. Joe versus Street Fighter. Uh, the other one. Is another G.I. Joe crossover. This is uh, G.I. Joe and the Six Million Dollar Man. Now, uh, this one here, uh, I'm not sure about the writer, Ferrier, but the artist on this, uh, S.J. Gallant, he should be familiar to you if you read G.I. Joe comic books at all, because when IDW uh, got the G.I. Joe license and they picked up the Marvel book, kind of where it had left off, and, which is called G.I. Joe, a real American hero. So they kept that book running and just kept renumbering it as if the Marvel book had kept going, even though there was about a 20-year gap in between these things. And they got the original writer, Larry Hama, to come back, and he's just continued to tell the story, and it's still going now. But, uh, yeah, Glant, he was on that book for years, uh, pretty much from the get-go, uh, and then I think he left that book specifically because he wanted a shot at this, and when he left to do this, they replaced him with somebody else. And that was maybe just like a year and a half ago or something. So, uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun. Again, here, if I can put, can I, I'll put you down, Casey, for a sec. So, again, I'll try and find, it's always, I never can seem to find a fun page when I, when I want one. But here's, so here's like, there's a six million dollar man punching out General Hawk. Now his, his artwork, I wouldn't say it's my favorite by any means. It's, uh, it's, I don't find it necessarily super distinctive. Um, 
almost a little basic, I would say, but it's the kind of artwork I've I've now just associated with the G.I. Joe book. He's been on it for so long, and it is a little reminiscent to artists of the 80s. So it just feels at home and comfortable when you read this. And even though I'm not super familiar with the Six Million Dollar Man, I'm a little... I'm a little too young for that. That was a little before my time. Um, I have a vague familiarity with it. Um, and yeah, you don't need background really on either of this. It's pretty straightforward. In this one, Cobra brainwashes a $6 million man. And he is kind of the bad guy through a lot of this. Um, but not just $6 million man and G.I. Joe, but they, the writer here delves into like kind of the old school G.I. Joe. Like the, the 12 inch dolls. and uh, Yeah, it's does some cool stuff in here and again this is a standalone book it doesn't tie into the main G.I. Joe series so you can pick this up and you don't have to worry about being bogged down by continuity it's just uh yeah kind of a general generic version of these characters that you know and yeah it was a lot of fun so that's all I have for that segment I guess so I don't have anything else to talk about there's not much point in uh making this any longer than it needs to be I guess I hope this went okay, and yeah, I'd like to do more episodes like this in the future. Again, hopefully I can convince a friend or something to come along and do this with me. I had initially asked a few of them if they'd want to be uh, guests on a, a podcast, because I was thinking of starting that, and I got a few, uh, like, yeah, that might be cool, but uh, now that I've decided to do this as a video, I think that might have deterred some people that don't want to be on camera, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, hopefully I'll have somebody on with me here soon. And I'll be back with another episode later. So, as always, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and comment. Until next time.